The, uh, the team is here um, and we're looking at uh, some of the questions for, for Asia and I think as a group what we want to do is try to give some information of use to you guys and so not just broadcast about what we're doing, trying to, to think of things which are useful to you. Um, and first off I'm just going to ask uh, each member to introduce themselves and the organisation they are representing. We'll then have a few um, questions to discuss around this market. But at all points of this, this is an open discussion now that you're so intimate and close with us to discuss. Uh, this is an um, open discussion, so if there's a question you want to put, then throw your hand up and we can, we can run things through. Um, and uh, take the chance whilst there's a, a group uh, here. These occasions with Asia as, and investors is becoming more and more frequent in all the conferences, as you'll have noticed. Um, there's been many conferences in the distant past where the panellists outnumbered the audience when we were talking about China. It's not now the case, so we're, mo we're moving forward. Anyway, so in terms of um, China and India, let's just run down the, uh, the panellists here. And I think the first point is that, as you may be able to tell, the first panellist to my left is not Vikram. Uh, it's actually um, Maya, who's, gonna, uh, who's, who's delegating for his boss, as I understand it. Um, so perhaps you could introduce yourself, because you, you need the most introduction, because we haven't got that information, and then we can pass on to the line. Sure. Uh, hi, this is Mayur Parekh filling in for Vikram. Uh, we represent uh, CIPLA, CIPLA's investment arm and the US specialty business. Uh, CIPLA, as probably some of you may know, is a large global pharma company based out of India. <coughs> uh, we have presence in more than 100 countries and uh, we are currently seeking and exploring inorganic opportunities to build out a US specialty innovative branded products business. Uh, I'm a medical doctor by training and turned over to the dark side and now I do a lot of PD. Thank you. James. Sure. Uh, uh, well, you can see my bow window so I won't go too much um, into it. I, um, I've been doing business in China actually for quite a long time. I, I started my career in the industry in, in 1986. And the first time I went to China was 1992. I was sent by Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, on assignment as an expat to, to Shanghai. And then um, when I was with a biotech company called Tularit in 2000, I was head of business development. And I started to work with the CROs in China. Uh, that's when uh, Wuxi Pharma Tech, Shane Pharma, was just starting out in China. Um, I started to, um, we started to, to work on 24-hour R&D model for the very first time when we were starting our business. So, I was the first biotech customer for both of those um, CROs mm -hmm. back in 2000. And um, I then went back to China. Uh, there on we, after we sold to Larry Guy, so I started a biotech company and shortly after we went public. On NASDAQ, I went back to China and set up my first joint venture with um, Folsom Pharmaceutical Company back in 2005. And there started my long journey in China and I returned to China as a venture capitalist in 2007. Um, first with Vivo Venture, later on with um, Quiner Perkins. I raised my uh, second fund in 2012, um, which was a $220 million fund, investing in Greater China region. And last year, I came out and raised my own fund. Um, so I have um, two funds that I raised last year, a $200 million early stage venture fund, focused on biotech and tech, and the an R&D fund, invest locally within China. So my fund is actually a global fund. In fact, in my new fund, I made a couple of investments. Unfortunately, none in China so far. <laughs> so, um, um, Are you going to take them into China? So my first investment is actually in UK. Uh -huh. And um, uh, I also made investment in Germany, um, uh, an investment in New York, um, and then um, another investment in, um, um, in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area. Um, I'm hoping this year I will eventually make my first investment in um, China. So your R&B fund is unused? Well, I, so that R&B fund, I had invested in the, so far in just one of the 
all kind of programs uh, for for uh -huh. companies uh -huh. that that's getting ready to go public because the R and B funds tend to be um, the limited partner base tends to be very short term focused. Um, they prefer companies with revenues, um, profits even better. Um, unlike um, our early stage venture fund, yeah. where we focus primarily working with universities, academia, and um, entrepreneurs, they're starting to, with new companies. Which in China, most of the R and B funds, um, they, they they don't understand what venture funds are all about. They're too short. Yeah. We're, we're used to these twelve year fund, thirteen year fund, um, but most of those funds in China are very short. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, I'm Tom Du, I'm partner of uh, Share Capital, uh, located in Shenzhen, China. Uh, we are a VC firm. We manage about a $1 billion capital size, and two-thirds of fund go to healthcare industry. Most of them are pharmaceutical. I'm a physician by training, formerly worked for FDA for seven years. Later, they start two company and uh, now become investor. And, uh, that's my story. <laughs> That's your story. That's your story. So my own background, um, I've uh, been either the founder or uh, co-founder, I think, of uh, 17 companies now. Uh, one of them was an entity called Ipso Ventures, which is an evergreen ventures firm designed to start companies. It was sort of um, starting a company to start companies. Um, and my family's been working in China for many, many years, but I wasn't really fully aware of that. I was just aware that the China market was something that all my um, founder, entrepreneur friends knew nothing about. And so in 2010, I left the, venture, the listed ventures firm that I'd set up and went over to China, or went around the world looking for where next. And China kept coming up as an area that I should go to. And so I then, uh, was advising a company in Nottingham in the UK and um, long story short um, became the chief executive of the company so that I could experience what it was like to take a company from Europe and go and set it up in, in China and all the technical details of the setup and the funding and the bank account which was a nightmare thing to set up but all sorts of practical details and I wanted to be able to do that for other people so I'd know what it was what it was like and uh, so we now have a uh, RMB fund structure very similar to this with a, with this moment of wanting very late stage however as of this week I just had some calls with our limited partners about doing some investments into pre IND projects and I hadn't expected that to happen with my China investors for about three more years it's moving incredibly fast that we're now engaging with China um, earlier than we had expected. The regulations have changed massively in the last 12, 18 months, um, and the market is enormous, just the whole simple concept of the market. So there's roughly, it's different estimates, 15% of the population has regular access to Western meds at the moment, something we would call Western meds and traditional Chinese medicine for the rest, and we're talking just about China here. Whereas the administration has set the task of that being 80% of the population to have access to that. So the growth opportunity for all of us in our different markets for China is, is extraordinary, um, but there are some difficulties that you have to get over in terms of practical ways of, of getting into the market. Um, so I think in just terms of first question for the panel here, we've got China and India in its different ways represented. And I wanted to get a, a sense, a litmus test if you like, of for an entrepreneur, what's the market circumstances um, for uh, entrepreneurs this year if they come to your market. Um, so it's really, uh, is it a financial winter or a financial spring? We're going to start with the most optimistic, I suspect. Let's hear. So, probably I'll go first. So, I probably some of you know that you know India used to be the pharmacy of the world, and you know we used to supply generic medicines, and probably half the volume of generic medicines supplied globally. And what has been happening over the past few years is that uh, the generic industry is coming under pressure, and these large global, uh, you know, large Indian 
Indian based global pharma companies are now wanting to switch to specialty or innovative side of the business. So there's a big appetite for you know Indian pharma industries amongst Indian pharma indus uh, companies to you know fund and uh, look at uh, inorganic specialty or you know innovative medicine opportunities. So, so it's, it's spring. It is spring. It is spring. Uh, but at the uh, yeah, we will discuss more about it. Uh, the right uh, valuations. I mean, right. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll come yeah. to that. Yeah. I'm sure. Tom, what about you? Uh, <coughs> financial winter, financial spring. Uh, actually, and uh, by the uh, end of last year, I saw that uh, winter is coming. And uh, and uh, if you look at the entire industry, it's a winter. However, it's not for biopharmaceutical, and the valuation is still high, and uh, we still looking for the good project and uh, this uh, still have a lot of money around so it's not winter for biopharmaceutical <laughs> in China. But it's, but it's winter for China. China. It's winter for other parts in China? Uh, winter probably for other industry and uh, probably and, uh, for traditional industry and uh, they're a little bit harder to get an investment of money and uh, but not for biopharmaceutical. Oh. So it's alright it's all right for us but everyone else is in uh, We are good. We are in the good shape. <laughs> James, is your, is your view as positive as that? Uh, I think it's financial winters in certain subsectors of, of, um, of healthcare, um, certainly financial spring for others. Um, for example, I think gene sequencing area, that's definitely in the winter. <laughs> that it's, it's, um, we've seen more and more company closing shop and faster than you could ever imagine, right? Mm. Generics. And then you go into hot areas like gene therapy, um, CAR T, PCRs. Wow, that's that's really hot. It's quite amazing. So I think the the haves and have nots are kind of obvious. Um, so it depends on where you are. Medtech is still very hard. Let's face it. I globally medtech is very very hard, except for China. Gosh, the medtech company in China are so highly valued, it's pretty scary. Yes. Yeah, but everywhere else in the world, it's, um, it's, it's, it's been a winter for a long time. You know, I, I think the general point is that um, India may have been in a more positive state recently than some of, some of China. I think in certain folk in China will be quite um, pessimistic. Uh, whether it's a means to persuade you to drop your valuation, that's another question. Um, but, uh, the concept of medical devices and those sorts of products, some places in the world, they're very difficult to get investors for. Uh, in the Chinese market in particular, that's still a very important um, scale, perhaps, for the sport market. Uh, and so I think if I was in those sort of markets as an entrepreneur, I'd be focusing on China. I'd be, I'd be talking to the Chinese uh, areas, and by the sounds of things, the uh, the Indian side too. So in terms of the subsectors that you'll really focus on, we'll start with you James, in terms of the people in this room here have all their different technologies. Yeah. If, you're, if you're allowed only to pick the top two, top three themes that are most interesting to you, you'd like to learn about and meet folk, what, what, what's on the list? Well, I, I, I think the, um, I, I really like the central nervous system area, CNS area. This is quite fluctuating. Yeah, so the, the head, you know, this is crazy, right? I this mean, week. So this I, week. I, you know, I, I never, it's been, you know, I, I was actually involved with uh, the, the original ASI molecule, it's an uh, Aeroset, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that many years ago, it's called E2020. You think about it, people probably don't realize it used to be part of Bristol Myers Squibb's pipeline until we gave it back to e, uh, the, the molecule back to ASI, which went to Pfizer, this back in 1993. So it's, it's really interesting to, to watch our whole franchise. Um, and we have had no breakthrough. So I, I got shy away from Alzheimer. God, uh, even to today, I won't touch it. But on the other hand, I absolutely love some of the newer uh, breakthrough in the, um, whether it's in epilepsy, it's in the um, depression area. Um, you know, the, the whole immunoneurology space is really happening. So that's really Before exciting. we get the full detail. Any any takers? Anyone in that market? 
See, that's, next, tell that's, you next one. See, see, see that's <laughs> a video of it, right? Because you know, I can bet you like um, probably eight to nine out of ten companies I look at today are actually in the immune, in immune oncology mm -hmm. in self therapy area it, because it's so hot. The oncology is so over invested. You know, you, you look at the whole pharma industry, you look at the whole biotech industry. That's where the money is going. But here's the funny part: is as an investor. You really have to be careful chasing the hottest thing. You know, we, we look at that sector, yeah. but we also look at some of the most underinvested area because the um, invest at the top, <coughs> invest at the top, and sell at the bottom is never a very but good strategy. You have a medical need across all therapeutic area, right? But you're just so crazy that everyone's chasing <coughs> in that sector, right? So, so I'm just giving folks some examples. So, what's your tech, what's your second top? Um, ophthalmology. So we, we really like the ophthalmology field. Um, whether you think about gene therapy going to that area, there are a lot of new pathway that we, we really believe in. You can do devices, you can do drugs. Um, we, we, with the aging population, it's a very important thing going forward. So, so some, some contributing view, right? CNS, ophthalmology, it's not exactly what most people are excited about. But ophthalmology, any takers? Yeah, you're on see, your own. See that? Well. See you're doing I mean. well. Good. Yeah. So, what's on what's on the hot list? Uh, uh, I like uh, both of this. Uh, also, I have investment in the ophthalmology uh, and uh, licensing. Uh, as, uh, I think this is uh, technology is changing, and a lot of uh, traditional area and uh, become uh, better opportunities such as <coughs> pulmonary. After all of those <coughs> delivery system change. Uh, we have a uh, better opportunity and uh, to deliver drug into the deep, deep uh, airway. And uh, so this is, uh, in terms of uh, oncology, uh, it's very crowded. You have to be very careful. When I was in FDA and uh, I stayed in the, that division for three and a half years, that time you can easily, because uh, oncology is uh, a family disease, a lot of, lot of different disease, you can see many, many small indication, no therapeutic uh, agent for the treatment, but today is very hard. So and, uh, be careful uh, the oncology area. I am uh, mm -hmm. think about uh, maybe you're too late and uh, jump in and uh, you, you, you're doing something and uh, uh, very actively and uh, suddenly uh, you turn your head to say our oh, role is already in phase three. And uh, so you're too late, and uh, so be careful in the oncology. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, the, the, the entrepreneur might not like to hear uh, that they're too late, but it might, be, it might be good advice, although this is quite a contrarian panel we've got here. Um, from the corporate point of view. So the three areas that you know, we are hot on, or that basically comes from our strategy, is neurology. Uh, respiratory and hospital products. Uh, so in, these are in terms of therapy area. We, and we do, you know, concur that uh, oncology currently is frothy, and <coughs> also the churn of the newer things coming in there is so fast that by the time somebody starts and you envisage the, the, the landscape is totally changed after, uh, by the time this product actually comes to market. So that has been one of our concerns and. Uh, particularly for CIPLA, uh, we really prefer uh, uh, working with known drugs. So either these are shelved compounds, these are repurposing opportunities, reformulating opportunities, uh, newer out of deliveries, but as long as they address unmet need and not are not merely incremental innovation. So mm. uh, we tend to work on these lines. Mm. Okay, so there's a strategic fit a bit with your corporate as well as the uh, yes. uh, investor focus. We have a contrarian investors over here looking for the alternative. We have, uh, for the R&B fund, there's very much more, uh, we have to be careful not to get caught up in the froth because that's talking about really well established and exciting markets for the sorts of investors that we have in that uh, area. Um, I have, I'm still, uh, naively addicted to Alzheimer's. I'm still looking to see how we're going to get an early diagnostic in that. We have all <laughs> sorts of data analysis things I'm doing. I believe that we'll get somewhere and even that will be a family of stuff too. But uh, I understand that that's a, that's a steep hill. Um, I think the other 
part that's interesting for me in this market is uh, the equivalence of traditional Chinese medicine and the Indian uh, equivalent. Um, what are you guys seeing in terms of the uh, importance of that um, traditional medicines for sourcing of new drugs and technologies or are we, are we replacing uh, are we re are replacing it? Um, who, wants, who wants to start here? James, what's your view of the traditional Chinese medicine as a source of new, uh, nicely tox-tested uh, products? Yeah, um, I actually, funny, it's funny, I actually believe in traditional Chinese medicine, even though um, most of the drugs that, that seem to work don't have clinical data, right? They're just well-marketed in the marketplace. Um, they generate a lot of revenues and profits for those companies. Uh, but a lot of the new TCMs, I think, um, um, I, I'm not as optimistic because if you think about the, the, the quality that you need to have, you have to go all the way back to um, the, you have to make sure these companies actually control the land that, in which they, yeah. they, they, they plant, right? Yeah. All the way through. And by the time you get to marketplace, you have to make sure there are significant resources to sell a market because it's a, it's a consumer branding um, exercise you have to go undergo. It's very different from traditional ethical pharmaceuticals. Um, so I'm not that optimistic. But do you think we'll get a, a, any sources of new drugs by analyzing well-established TCM? Uh, sure, but the question is why not patentable? That, that's the other issue that you run into, right? Yeah. And you, you'd be able to get a single molecule that, that you, really, you really believe is actually the, the active um, ingredient. It goes entirely right. against yeah. the theory of that's TCM, right. by the way. Yeah, which goes, well, goes against it, right? Yeah. So um, it's quite a struggle. So I am such a simple guy, you know, I have a small, farm. my farm is not that big. You know, I, I make a couple investments a year. I just think that the world is so big, why should I play in the TCM world? Uh -huh. It's, you know, that, that's how I think. Yeah. There's just so many, in, but so, 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 there's so much innovation globally. Yeah. So, so is, there, is there an Indian equivalent of that market? I'm completely out of knowledge on uh, So we have, we have a couple of uh, schools of thought of uh, traditional medicine in India. Ayurveda is one of them. You have Siddha, you have Yunani. Uh, Ayurveda is probably the most popular. Uh, I kind of agree uh, that it, it does lend itself for uh, discovery of new actives or, or refinement of actives rather. But again, I also see the other side is that uh, protecting them and building them into you know, sustainable business, uh, uh, business is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, mm -hmm. from a investment side, we stay away from it. But uh, from uh, from other parts of our business, do look at it. Interesting. So yeah. two so far saying yes. Interesting. Great source of new products, but we can't imagine how to commercialize it. Tom, are you on the same? Yeah. The same place. Uh, actually, I like herbal drug. When <laughs> I was in FDA, I, I was uh, uh, joining a committee and uh, this uh, form committee to have first the botanical drug guideline uh, in uh, 2005. Uh, that time, and, uh, a lot of reviewers in the FDA believe this is a new opportunity. And uh, uh, that committee was led by Bob Temple, Jenny Woodcock. And you can imagine and, uh, how, how much attention in this area. However, and, uh, when I go to the real world in the industry side, you feel and, uh, first of all, the hard part is CMC. And you have to control from herb. That's very hard. Secondly, and the herbal drug indication, traditional indication, is different from our indication in the modern medicine. Sometimes it's very hard to design a clinical trial. And uh, maybe they are very uh, effective, but it's uh, hardly to say, uh, to prove it yeah. uh, by our current design. So uh, you have to design a huge clinical trial with 5,000 subjects that's hard. And uh, from investment standpoint, uh, it's uh, harder to do. Mm, possibly. Um, I want to move to an area of, of interest to us all, which is valuation. And 
we've got some different markets, different approaches, different people here that there's a good chance to talk a little bit about valuation. Um, early in my career, someone said to me, uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you should never put a valuation on the table because you can only ever get it wrong. You either make it too high, so the investor walks away, or you make it too low, and he takes you for a ride. So what do you do? And how should an entrepreneur start thinking about this issue of, of valuation? Um, so I asked these guys to have a think about that. I'm going I'm to start uh, with Mayo here. Um, I asked them how to think about what would we say to entrepreneurs about valuation in the current circumstances. You share your, your uh, words of wisdom. So, you know, being a corporate strategic, uh, we tend to take a different approach than the VCs take and we tend to be more conservative. Uh, we weigh in the risk more than what the entrepreneurs or the VCs tend to risk it. Uh, uh, and that also is a challenge for us to, you know, to guide, get the right opportunities at the right value. Uh, but my advice would be that if you're working with uh, strategics or more so strategics from India or China, uh, I, I think it would be uh, fair to have a more realistic picture of valuations than... <laughs> than uh, well, whatever you uh, thought uh, it was, divided by... <coughs> but whatever you thought it was, divided by two. <laughs> then, then uh, yeah, divided by four maybe. Yeah. yeah. But if, you're, you know, if, you're, if you're an entrepreneur sitting here and you're thinking about this question of valuation, what should they do? First of all, do they come up with a valuation <coughs> to talk to you about? Yes, and definitely. You, do you demand yeah, that? Yes, yes. We you do. do? So you yeah, put we, them on the we, we, Yeah, we do want to see their commercial assessment. We do okay. want to see what they think about the numbers. We do want to see what they think about segmentation and more importantly, pricing. Pricing, I think, especially for the US market is a big... Uh, element out there, and I think a lot of this value. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, you're not. This is not an India application. This is a global company application. A lot of it, you're based, based US, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's a lot of uh, just because of the India ticket doesn't mean it's India market. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think pricing. I think a lot of this valuation plays that we see uh, tend to the uh, price and price growth tend to be very sensitive uh, parameters. And we see a lot of plays there could, you know, could have a huge swing in valuations. So, uh, I We're think talking about the future. Yes, but I, I think we are entering an era of uh, not so... So one, one tangible piece of advice for the entrepreneur sitting listening to you about valuation. Get the pricing. <laughs> Get the pricing right of this product you've not yet invented and it's for the future. James, the advice about valuation. James wasn't briefed on this question. Yeah, we, didn't, so, we didn't have time to talk yeah, about that. I think, um, well, valuation is an art. So, you know, I, I'll give you a good example. Last night, you know, our partners meeting Sunday night because we are partners globally. They're in Europe, in the US, and in Asia. So we have to do it Sunday night. And so before I got on the flight fly over, we're talking about two term sheets we, we recently issued, both in gene therapy, um, but in different areas. One of them, the pre-money pre is <coughs> two million. The other one is 20, tenfold difference. So I asked the team, so um, how do we arrive at these numbers, right? I mean, precisely yeah. what you said, right? Well, the two million was simple because it was, um, I was doing this deal with Michael Dell, and so with a Dell computer. So the guy makes a million bucks basically every minute, right? And so he was just doing a lot of, it's like a philanthropy, right? And so we, we fell in love with some, some, some professor. All right, and the professor just kind of said, oh, two million, D you know. <laughs> so there you have it, okay? It's purely professor and myself and Michael Dell just love the company. We just decided we'd put some money in the company and do that. The other one is they, they have some track record. So they, they've done something in gene therapy that was successful. Second time around, okay? Um, it's still Series A, um, still single, um, platform approach, but because of the track record, they were able to, when they talk to venture capitalists, they can demand this 
premium. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, I think those entrepreneurs that are doing it the second time around, the third time around, the guys like you who have done 17 times, you, you can make the premium because you've done it, you've been there, and you, you make money for the investors. So the next time you come out and do it, um, you can say with straight face, say, I want this. If you guys want to invest with me, and you trust me, and we'll do it, right? But if you're first time, be realistic. You, you need money to create companies, to create value. If someone is looking at you and say, I want to bet, don't worry, it's one million, two million, five or 10, it doesn't matter. You need a lot of money in our sector to create a great company. It's a long journey. Don't think too let's much just about do it. Let's just do the straw poll. Right. First time. First, first time. time. Okay. Second time or more. Ah. There's a, they're starting to get there. And it's, it's ludicrous. The best advice to any investor is come, uh, to any entrepreneur is go and do it successfully somewhere else first and then come, come and talk to me. It's not the, not the instruction you need. Um, Tom, your words of wisdom on this issue of valuation and how these guys, either as advisors or as entrepreneurs, uh, approach this problem. Okay, and uh, uh, let me uh, talk about the, the comparison. And uh, in, uh, in comparison to the United States and the pharmaceutical area, the valuation is too high, about three times three time high. The reason is uh, they have very limited project and a lot of money and also uh, most of Chinese investment and uh, stay on the VC side so the, for the early stage and uh, then their valuation is relatively too high and so that is why you can see in the GP Morgan and uh, even in this meeting a lot of Chinese people looking around to try to find a partner license and uh, something and uh, they can't do it there so the reason is uh, Chinese valuation is too high uh, well, and uh, this one is uh, make, uh, I, I fully agree with Jim, and uh, this make them sometimes uh, irrational and uh, to ask a big price and uh, by end of story raise no money. And uh, so this one and, uh, is the uh, current situation in China. And, uh, but in the US, uh, because of uh, so hard to find uh, the VC form, and most of the U.S. money stay on the PE side. They like later stage <coughs> to phase three. So the VC side is uh, harder. So is, uh, this one is uh, sometimes and, uh, they get nowhere. So probably ask uh, a professor how much valuation I should be. And, mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, no, uh, no clue. So sometimes you can say uh, the valuation is too high, sometimes it's too low. So that's uh, my feeling. So quick, a quick question. You, you want the, the entrepreneur to come up with a valuation, right? A bit, at least a commercial assessment report. <coughs> what, what's your view? Do you think that's... Do you, do you want him to come I, up with I, I tell entrepreneurs stories. I, I literally, they come to my office, I tell them stories of the different people with different background when they come to my office and they tell me. And I, I tell them how I bet on them. Yeah, the risk very far. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I, had a, I had a CEO that I knew because that she was doing a second company after the first time she was successful. Second time she came to me and she said, she and her team said, hey, we want to do this company. And I said, well, how much money do you need to start? They, 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 they gave me a number. So, so I, I wrote them a check that day. They literally, and they started using my office or some stuff. And for, they just had this business plan. And they, they said they wanted $15 million pre. You have to imagine. So they, when they came to my office, they, they just said well, they want to start a company. So at first I wrote them a check, half a million dollars, right? So they just started working in my office. And they're on the one they want to do Series A. They, are, they want $15 million. This is after I gave them a company. Uh, they, you know, to, to get money to start a company. But this became one of the most successful companies in Greater China region. This company called Sci Laboratory. Wow. So they, they, so I am the, I mean, I always tell people, I mean, when we started a company, we're just talking about ideas, right? And I, I, I wasn't thinking much about valuation. And so I tell everybody that was our company, I actually don't think much about valuation in the very beginning. But I'm more thinking about this group of people that I am actually going to spend my time and energy to write a business plan. I'm going to help them get the resources. You know, even the company side, you know, they, they send this deal with Tesoro. Right? Now, I had known Lonnie for many, many years as CEO, 
and they, 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 you know, my company decided I didn't put in the best deal on the table. In fact, their upfront payment was the lowest, right? But I made the phone call, and I knew the board members, so we got the asset to come in. And in back of it, we went public on NASDAQ. So I don't, I always tell people, I don't, I don't really think about valuation. At the end of the day, it's just my, me and myself, the entrepreneur, let's break the bread and figure out what makes sense. And then we'll go on a journey together. And My good stuff. Think, so that's, I, I'm, because otherwise I can't, I don't know what the valuation is. It's so, it's so early, you can't, you can't tell. However late we are, it's early. Tom, what do they, do you expect them to come up with a valuation? Uh, well, I'm staying on the VC side, and uh, so if for doing uh, angel investment on the first round, and, uh, so maybe it's uh, a person mm -hmm. and, and team, and uh, how much experience and, uh, uh, this uh, CEO have. And uh, if we start a company by, start by himself for the first time, Normally, I have to think about it. And, uh, <laughs> if he is uh, continuously uh, doing business and uh, start one company to another <coughs> company, I, I think uh, I am, I'm more comfortable yeah. and, uh, to be an uh, angel. And uh, probably this is a good opportunity to be an investor. Yeah, yeah. so you, you start off with, is there, are there two people on this team that I like? And then it might be an okay company. So that's the binary, do we take the conversation further? And then it's the experience of the team will uh, govern the next big step I think in terms of uh, in terms of what we're good now I'm going to open the the, uh, the floor in a second um, I'm particularly interested here from people who've had experience of accessing India and China um, and I want to just ask the panel before then how to go about accessing their market there was a conference I went to uh, probably six months ago now and I met I think 17 chief execs and strategy guys and I asked each of them uh, what they were projecting to get from the Chinese market, my own myopia, Chinese market in terms of um, revenue and investment in the next uh, five years. And all 17, we added up the total, see what we've got? Nothing. Not a single cent. And I asked them, why have you not got this kind of concept of market expansion on your horizon? And they said they know with absolute certainty they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do that market. And that's part of the motives of what we've been, how we've been set up, is to actually enable people to achieve this great, great step. But I'm, I'm interested from the panel. Again, you know, advice to people who are interested in advising and as entrepreneurs themselves, how do we enter? your market from a from a absence a, ex, you know external point of view where, where do you come from how do you actually in practice access that market so by market <coughs> in indian funds well because our, indian our geography and tends to be yeah, us yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, i think it would, be, it would be a good idea to uh, know where the indian companies are focusing the kind of risk appetite each company has their therapy areas of interest uh, and then we, most Indian companies are at networking events like these. Uh, there are few that are also happening in India. So I think the, just approach us like any mid pharma company you would approach in the US or a European mid pharma company. So I think that, and, and I'm coming more from a pharma, a strategic mm -hmm. pharma uh, angle, not so much from a VC angle. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from the company's point of view, be at the conference, meet the people, and it's as, it's as simple as that. Set up the office straight away. Uh, for an entrepreneur or for yeah, us? For an entrepreneur. Yeah, meet us. Meet us, get to know what we like. And okay. what, do you think, what do you think is difficult for people coming in from outside? Uh, like I said, uh, to appreciate that we are not big pharma, we are not VCs, we are uh, we're coming from a genetic mindset and trying to transition into uh, innovative medicine. We tend to be conservative, uh, more conscious of the risk. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, these are things that you know uh, because we we occupy Indian strategics occupy very uh, we are neither here nor there sort of space. So I think uh, as long as um, somebody is able to appreciate that what kind of assets or what kind of product, you know, you can feel it's quite difficult for uh, entrepreneurs and people from outside to engage with that kind of outlook because uh, it's. And you know, also, it's so unknown to them, it's so known to you. Yes, and other key thing that you know, Indian pharma companies uh, tend to look for is uh, risk money. So you know, we will be more than willing to give you an upside participation as long as we are able to you know, agree on a realistic risk money for the immediate next step going forward. So, okay, so it's all, all about the strategic, the, the input. Um, Tom, what about the kind of practical experience of, of going into China? What what would what do people need to know? Well, okay, uh, uh, to answer your question in another way, I think we've only got ten minutes. I, I, I <laughs> only uh, do business in China in the United States. I never go to India. Um, <laughs> if I want to go to India, first thing get a local partner. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you. Uh, so yes. Uh, uh, it's harder for outside and uh, go to uh, a place you know nothing, and uh, the, uh, we say and uh, not because of policy, not because of money, not because of product. It's detail. You don't know the detail, culture detail, business detail, policy detail. So better to get a local partner and uh, for outside. That's so for so for an entrepreneur here, you need a local corporate partner in China to be able to. That's the better. That's the shortcut. That's the shortcut. Okay. I feel. Is there a? Is there a? Is there another way? Actually, you know, I think one of the things we didn't touch upon is really I think there's an incredible advantage for European-based company now to access China, um, primarily because of the way that Trump administration have put up the CFIUS, the the firma, whole bunch of new requirements makes it so much more difficult for funds of China to invest in the United States, to access technology of the United States. Um, there's no such a thing at the moment in Europe. I think, so as a result, many of the China-based funds are more than ever uh, trying to access um, you know, technology of Europe. So for, for those of you who are looking for capital of China, there's no better time. The, the, uh, most of the Chinese-based um, funds, are done, they're, they're turning their attention to, to Europe. So the, it's the open arm. There's a recent, there's yeah. a recent announcement yeah. this last week, which comes into play in the first of Jan, which is a strict edict from above in China that it is to be made easier for investors to get their capital out in order to bring more capital to China. And it's really there's some major changes going on in in uh, yeah. uh, regulation and support for investors to to come to China. Yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of how does the how does the entrepreneur or the advisor enter the market? Um, well, actually, uh, there's so that you, you go to let, let's say Bio Europe, for example, that that conference, for example, there there are actually many conferences now. I just see so many China-based funds that that go these things. Um, they, um, but I can tell you, as I say, from my. Um, People met over over time. There is a very very considerable uh, internal belief that people don't know how to access China. And, the, and the same for I know. Thank God. I mean, so <laughs> I so I, I still have a lot of deal flow. Otherwise, guys, the competition would be god awful. Um, the the um, um, I I entirely agree on exactly <laughs> that point. By the way. <laughs> No, I, I'm being totally serious. I, I, I but you know, it's the, but China's not easy. Let's face it, right? Um, I think um, if you want pure money, there's plenty of capital. But if you want to access the market, be on the ground, doing clinical trials or doing preclinical studies, so on and so yeah. forth. Yeah, it's very hard. clinical trials is interesting. That's one of the areas I'm still really uncomfortable uh, in China. There's a lot of improvement in other areas of, of regulation, but that's still something that's very... Well, a very good example, right? You, you would think that, you know, Acovia, which is used to be called quintiles, so well known. But if you, you look at China, boy, they, they have to be one of the worst CROs in China. Okay, so if you're, you're doing... <laughs> no, no, I've got some competitors China, for that. <laughs> if you're doing Congo China, stay away from them. 
right? I mean, it's so there, there's some things that are really counterintuitive. Really hard, really hard. Right? I mean, it's just really bizarre. The, the things that you, you, you take for granted in this part of the world, you go to China. Yeah. That's just a different world. Yeah. So I think one key it. distinction that we need to make is funds from a particular country and actually market access or using the services from that country. Yeah. I think that the second part. That yeah, we're, we're talking about market access. That's, that's right. what we're that's talking right. about here. Getting yeah. into and really addressing the market. Come on, guys. What, who's who's been to, been who's open, uh, opened a company in China? Any? Yes. There's one. One. What was your experience? What's it? What was it like to do that? It was very difficult to get. The in contract. what way? What very difficult to get the contract. But if the contract was there, then it. Went relatively easy. Yeah. We did a track trans tech transfer. We yeah. did a joint vent, even a joint venture with a enterprise in, in, in Tianjin. So um, it works. Yeah. You know? So the, if the relationship is good, they you, you will be helped. This is the absolute yeah. simple point. <coughs> questions from the floor. Sorry. Any any questions from the floor for these guys? Anyone else got experience of India? Anyone gone into India? Because I've not done. This is, this is the, the learning for me. I'm, I'm going to speak to him afterwards about the whole India concept. But because the, the concept we had is that so many people are now interested in China. But look at the audience here. That we've still got precious little experience of taking yeah. companies into that uh, that market, and that is something we have to put put right. What's the What's the advice for? Uh, the, f the floor. Let's start with start with the India perspective. What's the what's the advice to leave these guys with in the last couple of minutes? Look at uh, Indian pharma companies as you would consider uh, other uh, mid cap pharma companies, European or US. And uh, there's a big appetite amongst Indian companies to uh, step up their innovation business. And uh, the lens still remains the United States and Europe. And uh, it's the funds that would come from India. Plus, uh, the other thing that would be available is the huge manufacturing and CMC competence that you know some of these Indian companies tend to have. So, yeah. Come and see. I think um, it's just like the Western world. Not all money is the same. So, so if you go to China, um, you should make sure your partner company or funds have the ability to help you set up infrastructures, help you do a lot of things, have the resources, for everything from registration of the company, hiring, firing, lab, a lot of the day-to-day the -day operational infrastructure they can help you with. Um, I think that's the most important part because without that, um, I think um, it's, it's a lot of risk, right? I think when you're in, in Europe, sometimes you can feel that you're chasing the money, uh, whereas in China, you're chasing the help. Yeah. And that's the, that's the, the capital is actually yeah. is there. Yeah. Tom? Yeah, there is a, uh, I still believe, and uh, there are a lot of opportunity in China, because uh, if you look at uh, this uh, healthcare industry in GDP, compared to GDP, China is 5%, the US is 15%, three times on the two girls and also the huge market. Harder part is uh, you have to know the cultural difference. But uh, uh, under this uh, Trump administration, I think a lot of uh, company, uh, Chinese company going to come to Europe. And uh, this is a good opportunity for the European company to get into China and uh, to work with the Chinese company. We, uh, we do say in the UK that Donald Trump is the best foreign secretary we've ever had. <laughs> yes. I agree. That's, yeah, that's one of them. Um, uh, there's a few things you know, going on. Generics and stuff is all being, being attacked in China. There's a lot of changes going on in China. It changes every week. There's a lot of regulatory changes, a lot of fantastic um, improvements. Uh, you do have to be there. You do have to be there. I visit between four and six times a year. I think 2014 there, I was on 10 trips. Um, you have to uh, get in there and enjoy it and connect with the, with the people. Um, we're going to close the panel here and I'm going to congratulate all of you on one simple fact that until I ruined it, we hadn't mentioned IP. Can you repeat this, please? So IP is not now anything like the issue that it ever was or was perceived to be 
those people who definitely don't want to go to China still hold it up as a barrier, saying they're going to steal my IP. Um, China has invented a lot of stuff, and when you do that, you have to have an IP system that works. And in our sector, China is absolutely aware that we will not come if they're going to mess up the IP. Uh, we also have a strategy for IP in China, which is called Air Cover. So we get the government to be directly invested in some way in all our projects. And so if you want to steal my IP, I can show you my list of investors who will be cross. And if the Chinese government's on there, you can, you can upset them if you like. I don't really advise it. Uh, and so air cover has proved, I think on two occasions so far, to be a really effective way of just getting rid of the whole issue of the, of the IP um, question. Um, it's a area of the world and an area of market that I'm completely addicted to. So I'm a terrible person to ask about China because I want to say good things about it and what's happening. But I really think it's a fantastically exciting time. You've got a great set of different skills and locations here to connect to if that's something of, of interest. So please do. Um, we have this offer which we say about inviting people to come to Wuhan. I work a lot of my time uh, in central China using uh, Wuhan, which is an amazing location as a jump-off point in, uh, in China. You know, Wuhan city is itself second-tier city, bigger than London, uh, in a province bigger than you know, UK in terms of the population, incredible infrastructure, incredible connections. We need to find, you need to find soft landing points where you can start, and my invite to all of you is if we're interested in what you're doing, we'll get you over to Wuhan. You may have to pay your ticket to get to China, but that's it. We'll cover all the costs of getting you into that market and introducing you to people and getting to know it. So we've got to get more people on this bridge, both directions. It's so, so, uh, so, so can, I, can I just make one thing? Yeah. I'm the official appointed ambassador for the city of Wuhan. So any one of you come to Wuhan, not only Steve, Simon can help you, but I can get you to see everybody from bottom to the top. So <laughs> there you have it. I love the city. It's, really it's a very, very cool really place, and you can fly direct from yeah. uh, fly direct from Heathrow now. Yeah. So, having sold the beauties of Wuhan, uh, we, <laughs> we work with the East Lake and stuff uh, heavily on this. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, and uh, questions to afterwards to all inside. We're here because we want to connect with people. Thank you. Thank you.